So, today what we are going to see is uh, various forms of loading that actually applied on the offshore structures and then how do we uh, calculate them, the magnitude and the direction. So, if you look at the gravity loads is the predominant form in onshore structures, I think most of you will be familiar is the weight of the structure, weight of the facility. So, gravity load comprises uh, fixed loads and then variable loads. You know fixed loads is predominantly your uh, superstructure or substructure self weight, weight of the structure itself mostly uh, not varying with time. Whereas, the variable loads like live loads or other facility loads sometimes vary uh, depending on the situation uh, from time to time during the design life. Environmental loads primarily consists of wind, wave and current and other loads if arise uh, we will see one by one. Then the accidental loads especially for oil and gas facility the loads arising from uh, fire and blast. You know you might have seen in uh, several cases where uh, you know <coughs> accidental fire occurs and the material of the construction gets degraded. It is not that the load is increasing the structure gets uh, you know the, the, the deviation of the properties because of change in characteristics of material. So, that is causing the structure to fail whereas, the blast actually is a over pressure when you have a contained room something like this when a blast occurs what happens there is no way to dissipate the pressure contained in this the build up of the pressure will cause huge uh, overloading. So, that type of loading may also occur uh, in case where the offshore platforms are uh, uh, subjected to such accidents primarily that is why it is called uh, accidental loads. The next one is the inertial loads due to uh, motion response for example, when you are transporting a structure from one place to other it is subjected to motion loads which will cause uh, you know inertia loads on the structure itself. But after the installation of the structure at the final location these may not be there because they are fixed structure they are not floating structures, but of course, if it is a floating structure then it will be throughout the design life it will be subjected to motion responses and then and then sometimes we have this vessel deflection induced rolls where the uh, floating structures have uh, action of waves and they bend upwards and uh, downwards due to the hull deflection it is subjected to additional uh, deflection induced loads which we will see sometimes cause for a concern but I think that will come little later. So, among the gravity loads uh, basically several things needs to be discussed. So, the first one is arising from structure dead loads is easy to calculate as long as you know the geometry of the structure and density of the material of construction I think everyone can easily calculate the weight self weight. So, basically cross section if it is a tubular section you can calculate the cross sectional area and then multiply by the length and you can find out the, 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 the total weight. Now, when it comes to analysis you normally distribute the load like I think in your mechanics you might have studied uh, basic mechanics where uh, you know the bending moment diagram for various forms of uh, uh, loading on a simple beam structure or column. So, basically mostly the dead loads are distributed on the member. Facility dead loads is basically the if you might have seen yesterday or the day before yesterday I have shown you several pictures of offshore platform. You saw that uh, uh, equipments, cables, pipes, other facilities that form part of the structure to produce oil and gas you know those facilities will, uh, will be considerable weight in fact compared to the dead weight that could be higher and they are all part of these uh, load conditions. The next one is the fluid loads basically you are pumping oil and gas from ground it comes to the surface and it gets processed. So, when you see these fluid loads they could be substantially larger magnitude because so much of volume is coming from ground and it will get filled with all the equipments wherever uh, processing is going on and that needs to be included and that could be uh, heavier. So, that is why we will see that gravity loads one is the uh, dry loads which are either the structure weight or facility weight plus the fluid weight the weight of oil and gas coming from ground. And the last one is the live loads basically uh, 
the variable loads both are variable loads fluid loads and live loads both are varying because fluid loads for example production rate higher or smaller will vary the fluid loads similarly the live load live load is but nothing but supply from external sources for example one of the platform is designed for uh, living facility so when people are living there you will get supply from sour like food items or other uh, you know the the supplies required for people to live there so they are all going to be variable loads sometime it will be heavier when the supply is reduced or the storage is reduced the loads will come down so basically the live loads are non fixed loads uh, could vary with time but then you can actually ask how much variation it's actually very small when you look at the magnitude of other loads for example dead loads and and uh, fluid loads these live loads normally magnitude wise is quite small so calculation of gravity loads i think is just as most of you are engineers i don't think we need to elaborate it's so simple there is no scientific idea involved except that you need to just know the size density and then calculate it if it is a structure if it is a facility again similar idea if it is a pressure vessel i think most of you might have seen a pressure pressure vessel it's just a large diameter cylinder closed at both ends so it will be like a big tank instead of vertical tank it is a horizontal tank most of the pressure vessel will be horizontal so you know the size you know the the cell thickness and you can calculate normally we don't calculate this kind of special items will be calculated by the manufacturer of the the facility so they will give you the, what is the weight of the facility or the equipment so you can take into account in your design calculations so calculation of gravity loads i think is quite simple so just we will see what are the idea behind so dead loads as i explained there you could easily calculate without any problem facility loads includes mechanical equipment they are the uh, predominant uh, uh, form in the any offshore platforms then you got electrical equipment as i mentioned every facility requires power to generate power to operate isn't it so you you will have a power generating equipment like a turbine generator and the fuel supply equipment then piping connecting each of these equipment is basically protection and then cables and other instruments which are very much essential you know most of these are um, hydrocarbon equipments many locations you will see lot of instruments and valves for control and manipulation you know sometime you want to shut down you will operate from a control room so all those items will form part of the facility loads which as structural engineer we don't have to worry it will be supplied to you this will be the weight at this location live loads typically if you, if you remember if you have studied uh, in the uh, national building code those who are civil engineers you will see that there are recommendations for various design um, of various types of structures on land residential building or uh, or industrial building or educational building public amenities each one category normally will be given a specific live load if you have uh, if you remember for example design a residential building 200 kg per square meter uh, distributor load is sufficient but if it is a industrial building because you are handling heavy equipments probably requiring higher load sometimes we design for 500 kg per square meter as a distributor load so you see here in this all these four categories identified as as loading areas it's not that the whole platform is going to be live loads because most of the area is occupied by equipments and facilities only the open area wherever uh designated uh, as as variable loading area there only you are going to use that most of the time the storage area will be very essential because when you are getting supply from uh, sour not only for uh, food and other items sometimes you have storage of chemicals for example the process platform may require substantial amount of chemical for feeding into the process systems so you will store lot of uh, containers or um, other types of tanks where it, you will keep the chemicals so basically the storage area that means we need to have 
designed for larger live load. So, the storage or lay down, lay down is nothing but you bring the weight and then place it on the structure and that is the kind of number. Sometimes we even design for uh, more than 20, but the typical number is about 20 kilo Newton per meter square. So, what is the number in terms of kilogram per square meter? It is 2000 kilogram. So, that means 2 ton per. So, it is a large loading you could see that. Whereas, the walkway access areas are galley, dining mess, you know. So, you could see that slightly reduced loading. And this is the type of typical numbers that you will remember. And uh, whenever you are talking about live load, it is not going to be few hundred tons per square meter. It is a very small number. So, you, you just the idea why I am giving this number is to keep in memory the magnitude, the order of magnitude. You should know how much <coughs> in relation to what is being done in the land based structures. Most of the uh, structures on land, multi story or single story building, not designed more than 500 kilogram per square meter. Mostly the, the heaviest loading that you design an uh, industrial building is about 500 kilogram, maybe 750, but not more than that. Except if you go to highways and roadways, you design for the multi axial loading where you could end up probably somewhere around 2000 kg per square meter, like a heavy bridge, heavy vehicle bridge could design for 2 ton per square meter. But most of the other light structures, the design loading is considerably around less than 5 kilo Newton per square meter. All of you are familiar with this kg and kilo Newton and this business, no? Because I keep going back and forth. If you do not understand, you better. So, what I would like to highlight here is the design loading itself comparing on land based versus offshore, there is a considerable difference in terms of live load. So, that you need to get it in your mind that we are designing for higher load. So, basically then we will move on to environmental loads, we will try to see uh, how much we can cover without uh, having to trouble uh, because you have little bit of idea about wave and current. If, if requires, I will open up a little bit of introduction here, I have a slides if required, so that the flow will be. Uh, we can look at the wind loads first, which will be uh, basically not a problem. Most of you have already got some idea about the drag force introduced by wind during your mechanics or some stage of your engineering uh, during your graduate study. Then the wave and current loads, if you look at the magnitude, wind loads and wave and current loads, it would potentially be a, a large difference because of the, 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 the way the structures are subjected to. Smaller portion of the structure is subjected to wind load because above water but the larger portion below water subjected to wave and current loads. That is not the only reason why the magnitude is larger because of the, the fluid density and the magnitude of uh, you know the, the <coughs> forces generated is higher. So, we will see that one of the days we will see how is the distribution, how many percentage is wind, how many percentage is wave and current. So, where should we give focus to accurately calculate the force? because that could change the way that the structure is designed. And typically seismic loads may not be coming under the uh, environmental load, but actually it is due to natural uh, disaster, it is again an accidental load. So, in this we have to get a clear idea for offshore structures. Normally, when you design an onshore structure, we do not differentiate between an operating condition and extreme condition, except that except that some classes of structures on shore, we do classify uh, abnormal condition like the, the, the structure may not be able to perform its function. Whereas, in offshore always we, we divide the you know the, the situation into two categories, normal operation and an extreme condition where operation of the platform could be hindered because of you know it is unable to perform or purposefully designed. We sometime actually design the platform in such a way that when an extreme condition occurs, we shut down the platform, reduce the production or stop the production or the living facilities, people could be evacuated knowing that there is a cyclone coming. Let us not uh, you know create a situation where we could not save the people. So, we shut down and evacuate the people to safe areas. So, that is exactly when do we decide at what situation we decide that 
the platform could not operate or the situation is becoming dangerous so that we can evacuate. So, basically the demarcation between a situation where normal operation or normal function could be performed to a non performance situation, we divide them into two categories that is why we call it operating condition and an extreme condition and uh, we need to design for it, but how it makes difference for example, when you design a building we do not we, we do not think of this situation because the building has to be occupied all the time. For example, if it is a residential building you do not think that any time we want to evacuate this house because this becomes dangerous, but then it actually not serving the purpose for which the house was built is not it. I do not think anybody want to evacuate unless a different situation like a flooding or, or, or damages happening because of some other sources of um, event, but normally you want to occupy the house 100 percent all the time because that is the purpose for which it is built. Whereas, in offshore structures we just slightly deviate because the extreme condition could potentially prove to be so high that the design becomes so uneconomical. So, that is where we just find a difference and the occurrence of such an event is so remote that means, once in several hundred years. So, when, when, when you encounter such a situation we try to do something slightly different, we want to take a higher risk that is the exactly the idea. We do not want to take a risk here whereas, we want to take a higher risk for the extreme condition. So, what it means for example, if you go to a beach or, or some days you will see sea condition is normal is not it, probably you will see a sea wave height of 1 meter, 2 meters, 3 meters, but if you go on a as on a day where a cyclone is coming you will see that wave heights are too large is not it. So, basically what we see is it is not that every day big wave heights are or big waves are approaching or coming into the location where the structures are designed once in a while we do not know when it is going to come. So, if you look at the history of last say few hundred years you will see that sometimes cyclones have come in every 20 years, 30 years and there is no periodical repeatance you know you do not know you will never know when it is going to come. For example, last this year few months back I think there was a cyclone crossing a location at Kadalur you remember reading newspaper the previous cyclone hitting at the same location was 1973. So, you see the large difference between the previous cyclone and now before 1973 there was a cyclone in 1950s which we do not even have a, a good record, but if you come to uh, some other location the previous cyclone and the current cyclone could actually be narrow. So, we do not know when which location the cyclones will come and create situation like the one that we are trying to describe. So, what we want to find out take the history and just look at the number of cyclones and the magnitude of the cyclone and find out once in so many years a larger wave height. I am just giving a typical example for a cyclone, but does not mean that we are only looking at cyclone extreme sea condition could arise from non cyclonic situation also. You could see that a particular day you can see a wave height is very large does not necessary to be a cyclone it could be a local storm or local depression it could it could lead to a larger wave height is not it. So, what we are looking at is, is the wave height or a sea state condition that exceeds a particular elevation. So, basically that is the difference. So, you see here this operating condition and the extreme condition the difference is sea conditions are very common when in operating condition basically a lower magnitude smaller magnitude occurrence of them is very often could be a return period of less than a year or a year sometimes we go for 10 year. So, the return period is nothing, but how often it occurs in a particular period. So, that is called a return period for example, the extreme condition we normally take 1 in 100 year or 1 in 200 year that means, at least one time within the 100 year period it will occur that is called a 100 year wave condition or if it is one year then at least that particular wave height will exceed will be exceeded within that one year period of timing. So, you can see that the smaller the period one year means the design wave height will be smaller you could expect the larger the period that you cover for example, you take last 100 years from uh, uh, 
1912 to 2012, you look back and just collect the data, you will see that at some stage during the last 100 years, a highest wave could have come at that particular location. But if you look at just last one year only, then you will not be able to have such a larger sea state probably, sea state conditions could be smaller. So, this return period is very important you should understand. I think at some stage you will learn this in hydrodynamics course, how to calculate the return period versus a wave height. You have to look for mathematical formulation based on uh, uh, distribution, which I think you will be able to get it. Otherwise, at the end of this course, we will also be able to look at it uh, at one of the days. So, basically the extreme and operating condition is very important because for example, normally during operation of a offshore platform producing oil and gas, we do not want to disturb the function at any cost, is not it. So, that we design for the wave heights designated and all the functions of the platform as normal. So, the sometimes we call it normal operating condition. That means, uninterrupted production. Now, when it comes to extreme condition, for example, a extreme cyclone or a extreme storm is predicted. For example, in few days time it is going to cross this particular location. Most of the time nowadays the, the prediction is possible, the tools are available, the, the projections are available, mathematical modeling is available. So, you will be able to find out in this particular location storm is going to come. So, we could do three, four activities. We could shut down the platform because during an operation if a cyclone hits or a storm hits, there could be a potential damage to the equipment number one. If a damage to a equipment occurs, what happens? It is not we are worried about the, the damage to the equipment. We are worried about the spillage of hydrocarbons because the first consideration is given to human life and then the environmental conditions or environmental impact. You have a spillage of oil, it could prove to be potentially damaging to the marine ecology. So, that is why first thing human life you evacuate the people, second try to make sure that the equipments are not damaged. So, if you shut down the platform, the potential disaster of pumping too much of oil into sea is avoided because by closing the valves, even if the damage to the equipment occurs, what happens? Only a small amount of oil could spill over because we have closed the valves which was flowing the oil and gas. So, extreme condition we could save human life by evacuating them from the platform number one. Number two, reduce the environmental impact by spillage and damage to equipment. What else can be done? Remove some of the loads from the platform. For example, you have designed a platform so uh, tightly that slight exceedance of load could make it to fail. So, you can actually remove some of the loads, So, but that is the last thing we, we normally do because removal of load involves again uh, different types of equipment required. So, normally we do not do it. So, now you see these three conditions you think about it when we try to design we actually consider in the design consideration remove the loads. Now, the third thing what we can do is we can take a higher risk because this particular condition is going to arise once in a hundred year is not it. So, can we allow the stresses to be higher than the normal? Maybe yes, because if you look at the design for normal condition, we do not allow this. We actually design for the stresses as per the codes, whereas in the extreme condition, maybe we could allow higher stresses because the chances of this occurring is very, very small. The probability of occurrence of this extreme condition is quite small. So, basically by, by this, I think you would have understood what is the difference between two conditions of design. This goes to both for wind, wave and current the extreme condition and the operating condition is to be defined for all the cases. So, now let us just quickly look at uh, loads arising from wind. I think this is also essential for onshore based structures. So, you could see a, a histogram showing a variation of wind velocity. If you go and put a, a velocity measurement device, I think you might see in most of the places they do this in meteorological department. They have uh, put the uh, meters. If you go to our SAC, not SAC building, somewhere nearby, they have got a station where it measures wind speed, temperature. 
so you could see the the meter there so basic idea is it is not a constant velocity as many of us normally think the wind is also varying with time but only the fluctuation is very much like a random signal you might see that it's not so regular nicely you know so you see there uh, the fluctuating component is very small but the steady component is quite if you see the dotted line in that is basically a, a steady component on which the fluctuating component is changing so if you go to a roof of a building sometime you could see that suddenly the gust wind applied on your body could you could feel the variation quickly and suddenly disappear suddenly there will be a gusting a large wind speed and then reduces so basic idea is for design purposes you could draw a line something like what i have drawn in a dotted line can take an average velocity isn't it instead of taking a design activity for all these variations for example if i take the lowest and if i take the highest in in this whole uh, stretch of data and then design for it lowest you don't have to design because anyway you know very well that the wind speed lower means don't have to worry so you normally take a highest something like like this peak value and make a calculation for the loading and complete the design that's what everybody normally think but that occurs only one time in the the record that you see isn't it which is not very good because once in so much of time is going to occur maybe not a very critical but then we have to decide how much how many times repeated could be considered as you know reasonable loading so that's why we need to understand how it varies if you do an average for example the varies from certain value say 20 meter per second goes to 30 25 something like this and look at the record for a longer duration take one year record if you have mostly we, do, we normally don't have this uh, record for longer duration sometimes you might have so you take one year record and average it isn't it you might find the average is smaller or higher you will find it quite smaller because many times wind may not be there quiet period you know it could be 10 meter per second or even less so if you take a longer the duration of average you will find that the values of average could comes down for example if i take a average over a very short duration for example if i go here say i take a 3 seconds or 5 seconds 10 seconds 1 minute take the values and do an average the values could be higher depending on where i do the average for example if i do the average down here i find all the values are higher than the the steady component if i do the average somewhere here i will find that it could be equal to the steady component so it depends on where i do the average is very important that's why we do a calculation called moving average you might have studied in your uh, mathematics you have studied no so normally you do our moving average and find out during which period is the maximum value so we call the wind profiling and and basically the gusting we need to determine which period of averaging will represent the real situation you know you you take an average over a longer period it's going to be very small average you are going to take a smaller averaging period you are going to get a so there are uh, several uh, techniques available so the mean wind speed which is going to cause the drag on the structures basically needs to be determined first and then the turbulent effect or the variation components could cause different response to the structures because the mean wind we can calculate the steady or uh, static forces whereas the fluctuating component we just need to see whether it's going to be causing any other trouble other than the conversion of the the gust wind to static loading now you see here uh, short period structures long period structures what i have just uh, Uh, classified this again goes back to your dynamics if you have a cylinder structure what happens the period is larger if you have a rigid structure the period is smaller you could easily compare you take a small stick you know you can just pull it from one side and just release it it could come to its neutral position the period of oscillation could easily be calculated depending on 
the stiffness of the structure. So, that is exactly we are talking about short period structures and long period structures. The longer the duration of oscillation is going to interact with the, the gusting wind. Whereas, the, uh, the short period structures typically like our jacket may not have such dynamic excitation, because you can convert the, the, the wind loads which are really dynamic can be converted to static loading. So, the, the idea behind this particular uh, picture is to say that most of the structures what we are designing based on uh, the framed arrangement, we could convert the wind loading to static loading instead of dynamic loading. The other hand if you go to uh, for example, you, you might see so many places in uh, land also chimney tall chimneys you might see they are cylinder structures and subjected to wind gusting could potentially create a dynamic interaction could fail also sometimes. So, that is why such type of structures we need to see dynamic response instead of static response. So, that is exactly the idea behind you need to get a demarcation what is a cylinder structure, what is a uh, short period structure or rigid structure or structures that is not responding to dynamic loading. It is not that it is not responding the response is so small whereas, when you look at a tall structure even the, mag the magnitude of loads are small the response could be larger because there is a resonance characteristics near resonance characteristics and that is what we are going to see. Now, the wind gusting and the, the profile let me just see whether I have a picture supposed to be not here. The variation of the wind speed with height I think that is most important uh, uh, in, in. So, how the wind is blowing and when you go higher and higher I do not know whether any of you have gone in a tower if you have just go up a tower cylinder tower like uh, transmission tower or water tank if you will see that the wind speed as you go higher and higher wind speed wind speed increases or decreases in, it increases. So, basically what is the profile of the variation is very important. So, you will see that um, supposed to be having a profile I think is missing in this particular anyway we will see. I will draw a picture. So, typically if you see there something like this. Normally, So, if you see this wind speed variation with respect to height, if you look at this picture, something like this and in this particular uh, picture I have put V naught which is given at 10 meter most of the wind records given by the meteorological department uh, they give the velocity measured at 30 feet above mean sea level. So, this is mean sea level the reason behind is is typically uh, everybody follows the same uh, idea of measurement and even if they measure at different place they recalibrate and give you the values at 10 meter. So, any time when you see the records from a measuring agency or a reporting agency or codes or some reports you see that the most of the velocity or the wind speed given is at 10 meter from mean sea level and the variation is taken as uh, the here v naught multiplied by y by 10 because 10 is your the velocity measured and to the power 1 by 8. So, if you plot this function like this it goes almost like a uh, 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 increasing trend with a exponential function. So, you can see that the height is increasing you will find that the velocity change is quite high, but after certain height it becomes almost 
no change. This is what the formula normally we use for quite some time. You know, this is given by uh, uh, typical uh, variation in many of the textbooks as well many of the uh, government agencies. For the last so many years, we have been using this simple form to estimate. If you look at some of the design codes, for example, if you go to IS, IS codes, I think 875, you know, you, they will be giving you a different uh, formula to calculate. So, how you will find, you will see that uh, velocity is a function of uh, k 1, something like this. You may also have k 2, k 3 and so many other functions. So, this k 1 or k 2 could be a function to describe the variation, we call it a terrain or height, height effect function. So, it is exactly the same, this here, this y by 10 to the power 1 by 8 or 1 by 9, 1 by 10, again uh, depends on which recommendation. Whereas, API, this I have taken from API, is giving you a slightly different formula, little bit complicated, but again the result will be similar. What, what we are seeing is almost same. So, you see here the velocity or the wind, wind speed at certain height and time, this is very important. This one, what we have here can only calculate with respect to height, whereas the formula given by API could calculate with respect to height as well as with respect to averaging time. Just earlier we were talking about 3 second average, 5 second average, 1 hour average, 2 hour average. So, that is the idea behind, we could calculate if you know only one particular wind speed, we want to find out the extrapolated value for uh, uh, averaging time, different averaging time, then you can use the API formula. That is why we use this. So, it is a little bit uh, complex because it is an empirical formula. It is not a derived from uh, first principle, it is an empirical formula. So, you have to be little bit careful using this because since it is an empirical formula, you have to follow the units correctly according to the recommendations given by API. You understand the difference between empirical and uh, the formulas derived, you know. The empirical formula, there are constants. You see here, there is a constant 1 minus 0.41. This is not derived from somewhere. It is a, it's a, it's a correlation fitting based on the measured data and analysis done by the researchers. Come up with this could be potentially projecting for the, for the particular area or location. Unfortunately, this is given for US. Uh, uh, continent, but we simply follow because it fits very well. I think many of them have been tested, so we still follow in elsewhere. Even though this whole equation is only relevant for the the Gulf of Mexico area, so basically, if you are given a particular uh, averaging period, T naught is equal to 3,600, which is nothing but the averaging is one hour. So if you are given one hour averaging period, then you can calculate any other averaging period and you are given only the wind velocity u naught at 10 meter from sea level. So, you can calculate height elsewhere. So, this formula is very generic, very general because height variation as well as time averaging can be calculated. So, you see here in this particular function, there is a function called uh, turbulence intensity function to take care of the averaging is I of jet and is highly empirical. What is the function here is basically u naught is the, the wind speed at 10 meter and jet is the elevation in terms of feet. You have to be very careful because this formula is written in terms of feet and feet per second. So, if you want to use it for your project, you have to convert your wind speed to feet per second, elevation to feet, come here, calculate it go back and then convert back to your units. So, do not just put anyhow any number and then it will become a bigger problem. And C is a constant which is given in this kind of form and then the elevation variation is given in terms of u jet. All of them are substituted here and finally, you get any conversion from particular. Uh, so, this is basically an idea that is used for calculation of wind speed. Now, normally you see here wind averaging. All of you understand wind is not a steady state uh, uh, business. You understand the, the idea no? that you have to get it and why what we are trying to do a 
conversion from uh, gusting wind or dynamic wave, uh, dynamic uh, variation to a steady state because we see two class of structures. One is short period structures and then long period structures. Long period structures anyway we are not designing. For short period structures, conversion from dynamic loading to static is very much essential because it simplifies the design procedure. That is what we are trying to do. But when you are doing research, maybe you do not need to do all that. You can do a dynamic simulation. Whereas, design always remember simplification, so that you could design it well within the time period as well economically. So, in here you see the wind averaging period. In industry, several uh, averaging is used for different class of structures starting from 1 hour average, 30 minute average, 10 minute average, 1 minute average and ultimately 5 second to 3 second gust. So, the 3 second gust is the highest wind speed that you ever recorded. You will see that if you go into a national building code of India, you will see a wind distribution chart. What is given there is actually 3 second gust because that is the highest magnitude you will find. 3 second is quite a small one unlike um, the 1 hour average. So, the 3 second gust will be recorded and given to you. From there you have to calculate back or uh, convert them. So, the exactly opposite is coming here that is why we, we have got a problem. If you are given a 3 second gust using the API formula, you cannot convert to other averages. You understand the idea? No? So, that is why we have to go and ask the uh, people who are recording and giving the wind speed, give us the wind speed in 1 hour average, we could calculate the others and that is the practice in US. They normally give a 1 hour average, then you calculate the others. Whereas, in India we have 3 second gust how do you get back the others? So, we cannot convert and we have to ask the agencies giving this data to calculate and give us. So, most of the agencies they give at least 1 hour average and then at least 10 minute and 1 minute average which will normally be required for design purposes. So, all of you understand the, the method called what we are trying to do for averaging. Averaging is nothing but taking a history, time history of the wind speeds and cumulative summation divided by the number of uh, sample points. So, at least you get a averaging for that particular period, but then again uh, scientific method of uh, moving average has to be done, because you cannot take a sample on a particular location I will do average, then I will get the. So, you got to do a blocks of say for example, if I want to do a 10 minute average, it is not that I only look at the 10 minute, I got to look at 10 minute average of several blocks and then get the, the highest value. So, then that will be the 10 minute average. A typical example I have just given you here uh, for uh, calculation how it is done. So, calculation of C value and given for uh, U naught is given as 26 feet per second in this particular example and just substitution of values. I will show you how the variation is. 150 feet 3 second gust versus 150 feet 30 minute average. So, you can see here 3 second versus 30 minute the values become 34.3 down to 31.4 using the same formula what I was just explaining just to demonstrate how the averaging period affects or reduces or increases the wind speed. So, basically you see here 3 second gust, 5 second gust, 15 minutes average, 30 minute average gradually the values come down just because of the reason I explained in the first slide where the variation when you try to do an average smaller the period of average you get a higher the magnitude of the wind speed. Similarly, the variation with respect to height if you see same I am just to do using the uh, 3 second gust as an example and the 3 minute average as an example 50 feet 100 feet you see the values increasing from 32.7 to 33.7 approximately about 5 to probably about 5 percent, but if you go higher that could prove to be slightly increasing and as much as if you go from uh, say 10 meters to 300 meters you could see that 20 percent increase 30 percent increase in the velocity. Once you see such kind of variation or increase later we will find that when you calculate the wind force the drag force is proportional to square of the velocity. I think most of you remember the drag formula 
So, basically that means the force will be even higher that is one of the so that is why the calculation of velocity has to be correct and accurately to be predicted. Of course, fortunately in the offshore structures we do not have too, too much height maximum height could be uh, say 100 meters whereas, if you come to land based structures the towers and buildings nowadays goes as much as hundreds of meters is not it. So, you could see that the velocity could be considerably uh, important in that kind of cases. This I think we have already discussed, but in specific uh, case we will uh, just take the recommendation of API. What API says how do we approach this problem? Now, we know that the wind gusting is varying and you see here smaller elements in structure. For example, we saw structures containing so many elements. So, you one particular element in a structure for example, a structural member designed for 3 second gust individual member local design that means that members are supposed to be uh, susceptible to 3 second gust you must design for 3 second gust wind as a single element in the structure. But when you design the whole structure that is not necessary that you have to design for that particular 3 second gust because it is a global loading number 1. Number 2 the chances of all the elements subjected to the 3 second gust is very small. So, that is why we can go for a slightly increased averaging. So, when you have a structure smaller than 50 meter that means smaller sized structure designed for 5 second gust structure larger than 50 meter bigger size 15 second gust deck structure 1 minute sustained or 1 minute average sometimes you will see a word called sustained is nothing but averaging period and then the jacket structure designed for 1 hour sustained or 1 hour averaging 1 hour mean all three words are same sustained averaging mean all are sometimes people use a different uh, terminology. So, you could see that for a substructure and a superstructure there is a design wind speed different basically 1 minute sustained for superstructure versus 1 hour sustained for substructure. The idea is we would like to take a slightly uh, less conservative because if you take 1 minute sustained for substructure design you could actually make the structure very big whereas, it is not going to happen not all the elements in the structure is subsequent to similar wind speed and these are all uh, recommendations after a thorough study over a long period of time. And in fact, the previous revision of API did not give such recommendation in fact, it was left to the designer to decide, but now after a, a thorough investigation they have come up with this recommendation. So, that to avoid either under design or over design many times goats give you the such kind of uh, uh, ideas. So, you could see there is a, a last column on the right side dynamically sensitive dynamically insensitive you know basically that is again. So, that is why on day one I was talking about design of offshore structures two things are very important you need to understand clearly the dynamics of the system and the foundations of the structure where it is fixed. These two together form very important aspect because the dynamics ultimately will depend on the how the fixity conditions in the ground. If it is rigidly fixed you will see that structure behavior is different. So, you must actually go through those two courses then you can appreciate how dynamic play a vital role in, in changing the characteristics. I think most of you could remember or if you do not remember also does not matter is basically a simple uh, uh, formula uh, it is a drag formula 1 by 2 rho g and v square rho is the density of air g is the gravitational acceleration. Have you seen this formula before uh, in other forms it is very similar to kinetic energy is not it you know basically uh, the energy of the wind half m v square you know it is very similar. So, if you substitute the density of air and uh, gravitational acceleration you get a such a simple formula 0 0.6 v square you have to remember all the time in your life because this will be used very often whether it is offshore structure or onshore structure or whatever you design you will get this formula. So, 0 0.6 v square the unit is Newton per meter square do not make a confusion there. And if you remember this if you this is F w is the wind pressure basically unit wind pressure and basically if you know the area of projection of the structure you could apply area times 
this pressure and find out total force. I think we can stop here.